Lemon tree, very pretty, and the lemon flower is sweet, but the fruit of the poor lemon is impossible to eat. Lemon tree, very pretty, and the lemon flower is sweet, but the fruit of the poor lemon is impossible to eat. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever in the world you may be. Um, I hope you are having a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in to Lemonade Legend podcast. Right now we're in the middle of doing a series um, on the authors of the Lemonade Dan book two, which um, is um, coming out in February. I never give up an exact date because um, just too many uncertainties. <laughs> but we are looking at February for book two to come out, and I'm so excited about it because we've got really some incredible authors. And today um, we have Miss Don Hopkins with us uh, from Phoenix, uh, with well, the Phoenix area in Arizona. So welcome, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Super excited to be here. Good, good. How's the weather been there? I've been hearing that uh, it's been kind of a a little on the cooler side for normal. Yeah, it's definitely been uh, chillier in the evening for sure. Um, and then, yeah, during the day, normally I think we're probably in the 60s or 70s and it's been definitely cooler than that lately, but it's nice in the sun and I've been teaching some classes outdoors. So um, it hasn't been too terrible. I have I have a training center in Canada. I talked to them and they're under snow right now. So I'm feeling pretty blessed right now. <laughs> well, and, and I'm sure there's quite a few people that, you know, would listen to this and go, what? <laughs> exactly. Oh, poor you. <laughs> yeah, I'd give anything to have some weather like that. So, um, well, that's why that's why we endure the, uh, the, the heat of the summer there is to uh, have the winter months that that we can enjoy so um speaking of doing some classes outdoors why don't you um talk a little bit about um what you do when you're not writing a chapter for the lemonade stand <laughs> all right so i'm the uh founder and president of inspiritus yoga holistic wellness and training and um, what we do is we equip yoga instructors to teach. We provide continuing education and master's training for existing yoga teachers. Um, we also provide a lot of different wellness programs and services, including some healing um, modalities like Reiki and Thai yoga massage, yoga therapy, I work with private clients quite a bit in that regard and also do group classes um, around yoga therapy. And I'm a wellness coach and a mindful eating coach and facilitator. So I've got my hands in quite a few things, um, but I love it. It is it is my passion and my purpose. And um, it really is the alchemy of my story that led to this. So we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. <laughs> Of course, of course. So, um, so how have you had to adapt over this period of time with, with uh, COVID? Um, when obviously a lot of what you do is a very personal, you know, hands-on uh, type of, uh, type of thing. Yeah. So um, certainly, you know, we've been following CDC recommendations, and so there was a period of time where my yoga classes uh, were not in person at all; they were completely virtual and online. Um, I do work with private clients online as well. Um, we adjusted our teacher training programs to be online when we had to be. And we're offering a lot of um, different ways to participate. So we might offer a course where somebody could be in person, online, or watch it via recording after the fact. So it just provides opportunities for people you know, all over um, for you know, the programs to meet them where they are. Um, but certainly it's been challenging. Um, people are now after a year of this getting a little fatigued about Zoom. Um, with the recent rise in COVID numbers, uh, we're seeing less and less people wanting to be in person. So, you know, 
we're just continuing to try to adapt our programs um, to meet people where they are the best that we know how. Well, um, uh, as always, I'm the lemonade lady, so I'm, I'm always looking for what, what, what's the good out of this. And I, I, can, I can tell you um, and thank you that um, yoga is something that I've always wanted to um, uh, wanted to do and be a part of, mostly because I know that I have very, very poor uh, core strength. Um, but what's always been difficult for me is taking group classes because I don't hear well. And I'm the one that's twisting around like a pretzel, you know, trying to look at the instructor because I can't hear, you know, what 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 the instructions are. So uh, I'm sure I'm not getting what I need um, out of the class when I'm having to, you know, go into contortion to try and uh, you know, take a look at the yoga instructor. <laughs> so my silver lining has been, um, so we've done some sessions online and uh, and recorded them. And so even though there are still some times that I have to kind of look over to the computer and the Zoom, make sure that, that I'm doing it right, the more I go over it on the recorded session, then the more I go, okay, I'm spot on, I'm doing what I need to do. So, I guess in some ways, it, you know, we need to have these little dark moments for, you know, to discover um, new ways of doing things. And I would certainly uh, not discourage anyone from uh, taking the online route um, because uh, it, it, it's very personal. Um, and, and personal in that you, you also offer Christ-centered, um, uh, yoga, which, you know, um, includes the, the meditation and you so appropriately pick what I need to hear <laughs> at the moment um, that we are doing a session. So I, I just want to say there are good things out of that and, and that I, I hope people will, you know, continue to take advantage of it. Yeah, I'm finding also that um, people who might not feel comfortable going into a group class to take a class because they're not feeling as confident in their abilities or they, you know, have a, maybe they're a little self-conscious or a little reluctant to get started. Um, I'm getting new people because they feel comfortable in their own homes. You know, nobody can see what they're doing um, except for, you know, me um, and it kind and it of doesn't really, matter what they look like in the yoga. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't matter what they look like, what they're wearing, you know, ex and they're finding a little bit more freedom in their own bodies in that way. And um, it's really nice to see that more people coming and trying things out because they're, you know, I don't know, it kind of removes the intimidation factor. Well, and we were also talking um, just a little bit before uh, uh, going online here about what a great tool it is in terms of mental health. And uh, I mean, it's great for the physical and that's the way I've always kind of looked upon yoga, but now I'm starting to understand um, the need in terms of depression. Um, and although, you know, that's been helpful. I'm down here in Panama right now for a short period of time. So the weather is such that I can swim that's been an absolute lifesaver for me is to get out because we've had um, definite quarantine restrictions, but I'm, I'm in a condo, so I'm technically not leaving the condo if I'm using the pool. Um, and uh, so doing those kinds of exercises, yoga and, and, and the pool has been like keeping me like happy. <laughs> Or, or at least, you know, semi there, because there have been some days it's been, you know, pretty tough. And uh, then you go out and you get you know, your, your dose of exercise um, and it's like a whole new world. Yeah, there's so much more uh, benefit to yoga than just the physical. Um, science is now showing and proving the mental health benefits of yoga in terms of stress reduction, stress relief, um, helping with things like anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, 
um, and boosting overall mood and improving serotonin levels. And so there's a whole body of research behind it. Um, I also work with people who have trauma and PTSD, and certainly those numbers are growing given what has happened over the last year. So um, I love to be able to provide people with, with tools and things that they can use um, to help them mitigate you know, what is happening uh, for them in regards to this pandemic and the isolation and everything um, and the impact that that has had. Yeah, well, that's a great segue into uh, your story too, because I know that uh, actually when we first talked, the discussion wasn't so much about your story, the discussion was which story. <laughs> so, um, in fact, when people tell me, oh, I don't have a story, I say, oh, you have a story. In fact, you may have more than one. Um, but uh, you knew you had different stories inside of you that could offer inspiration. You chose to write about um, uh, love and the love you have for your current and most wonderful um, husband, Bob, and um, who I feel like I need to steal from you. <laughs> you talk about it. <laughs> I could steal them, but you probably you probably just can't go right back. So it doesn't. Yeah, that won't work. But um, <laughs> but you went through a lot before you found um, your true soulmate, and um, a lot of that is what led you to yoga and mindful uh, eating. So um, without giving this story away, um, talk a little bit about you know, where you were at from um, a mental and, uh, um, and physical uh, standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I feel like um, it is so important that we talk about mental health issues. We're seeing such an, you know, an increase um, in these challenges and removing the shame and the stigma is so vitally important. And so part of my story involves um, some mental health challenges that I had along the way. So when I was young, um, I struggled with an eating disorder. I grew up in a very dysfunctional home um, with a lot of fighting that would escalate into domestic violence. And I, I feel like part of my eating disorder was born out of just that anxiety, that lack of control, that chaos, right? Um, which is very, very common. And I was in um, a body conscious sport. I was a, a springboard diver. And so the pressures to look perfect and you know to have the perfect body, like all of that I think compounded. Um, and it led to some very dysfunctional eating and a very dysfunctional relationship between me and my body. So um, over the years, uh, I was able to overcome um, the eating disorder behaviors, but the mentality was still present. And I carried that into um, adulthood and beyond. Um, and it wasn't really until I was exposed to the Am I Hungry Mindful Eating Program and met Michelle May, um, who founded that program um, and became friends with her that I started to unravel kind of the final residual stuff that was hanging around in terms of my relationship with food. Um, I had gotten really good at being a restrictive eater. Um, I was very, very focused on health and wellness. I, at the time I met her, I owned a gym and was a personal trainer. And, um, but the mentality was still there. And um, she saw that in me and very gracefully encouraged me to take her program so I could refer other clients to her. Um, you know, the, the people who were coming to my gym who, who needed some support in that way. Um, really, it was for me, first and foremost. And so going through that program uh, revealed so much and helped me to heal my relationship with food. At the same time, I was exposed to yoga, Christ-centered yoga and, um, specifically. And um, I hated yoga in the beginning. It was awful. I, I couldn't be still. I was so used to being an athlete um, and moving and challenging myself in that way. And so the stillness um, was difficult. And I think the stillness was difficult because of what was going on here. And so, um, 
so over time, um, I started to, like, I fell in love with the practice of yoga because there was this spiritual component present that I really connected to. And, and then I started to really connect with my body in a different way and started to appreciate what my body could do instead of focusing on my appearance. And I was making these mind body connections and I felt the mental health benefits of yoga. And so it was all kind of coming together at the same time, which ultimately led me to be trained as a mindful eating facilitator and get trained as a yoga instructor, because I wanted to be able to share with people the amazing um, gifts that I was receiving and the healing that I was receiving and the transformation that was taking place. I wanted to provide that to other people. So, um, so that's kind of, you know, like the overarching, um, you know, storyline with respect to my career choice now and, you know, becoming a um, yoga teacher and a yoga trainer, yoga teacher trainer and a mindful eating um, facilitator and coach. So yeah, very much a part of my story, but you know, the backstory had a lot to do with what was going on with my relationships too. So I don't know if you want me to go there yet or well, what you yeah, want to you know, let, let, let me pose it as a question. Um, so I know my husband and I um, uh, have, have talked about this. If only I knew you when kind of thing. And, um, you know, we both have previous marriages and children from those marriages and and every time he says that i say no i wouldn't have been ready for you and you wouldn't have been ready for me and so that was kind of the, the question is that as, as in, um amazing as your your relationship is now with with bob do you think that would have happened if the two of you would have been you know in a position to meet each other you know many years ago Absolutely not. I would never have been, I, I probably wouldn't have even seen him for who he is back then because I was such a mess, quite frankly. Um, and it's okay. I mean, I can say that now I can look back and say, yeah, I was a real mess. And, um, you know, I ended up in some really dysfunctional relationships that all, you know, we're holistic beings. And so if we're struggling in one area, we're struggling in another. And so in the ways in which I was struggling in my own body, in my own mind, um, and uh, my self-esteem being affected, um, I ended up in some very dysfunctional relationships. And a lot of it mirrored the relationships that, you know, that I grew up with. And so um, it's funny how history repeats itself, you know, and you don't even know it's happening because you're just kind of used to it. And that's what you are familiar with. And that's what you grew up with. Um, but at some point there's a tipping point and, you know, you have to make a choice. Am I going to continue to repeat these terrible patterns in my relationships and be with people who are um, abusive or, you know, at, at the very least in a dysfunctional relationship, or am I going to sever those ties and and evolve into something else and it was through i think it was through my relationship with god it was through a, a new relationship with my body it was through restoring my my mind that i was able to be ready for a guy like bob following two failed marriages well and to that point true i i think everyone's tipping point you know is different um triggered by um whatever their situation is you know um if people women in particular will endure some some pretty bad relationships um before they'll allow themselves to you know hit that tipping point to say enough of enough and i need mm -hmm. i need to be out of here <laughs> Um, yeah. Any, any words of wisdom uh, on that, having gone through a couple of bad relationships or how you, how you um, sort of ease yourself out of them? I, I was thrust out of it. <laughs> 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 that being said, um, you know, I would just say that the, the more we get to know ourselves um, and the more we find a love of self and at the very least an acceptance of self, um, 
the better our relationships are going to be. And um, I had to make peace with me. You know, I had to learn to um, accept and love myself um, and, and then start to reveal like the true self, like, who am I really, you know, what do I really, what do I really want? Um, I spent a lot of time being a perfectionist and a people pleaser and peeling away at that and allowing myself to be authentic and transparent and, and go, oh, by the way, I'm not alone. Nobody's perfect. Wow. There's a, there's a, <laughs> an aha moment, right? Um, Oh, come on. All the people on TV are perfect. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> well, and that's what they want you to believe, you know, and we, we grow up in this culture where it's smoke and mirrors and, you know, yeah. it's all glossy and pretty. And the reality is that, that, that is not truth. And I think starting to peel away at that is, is just really important. Um, it's part of why I do a lot of body image work because, you know, we're in this thin culture, this diet culture. And meanwhile, people are, they're not healthy. They're, you know, they appear to be healthy, but they're not. Plus we have all this Photoshopping taking place and, you know, yep. photo editing. Um, it's not, what we're seeing isn't even real. And we're aspiring to these standards that are, are not realistic and they're not real and they're not necessarily healthy. So um, anyway, I think I'm kind of going down another rabbit trail here, but um, <laughs> I, you know, for me, it was learning to love and accept myself, um, receiving the love of God and realizing I was a child of God and I was loved exactly the way I am. Um, and, and then starting to, uh, I don't know, look at other people's relationships that were healthy and vibrant and going, wow, I, I really want that. And that is part of my story. I saw Bob um, and his late wife, Sandy's relationship and was like, I have nothing like that. I want that someday. I didn't know it would be him um, because, you know, God works in mysterious ways, but um, but I wanted a relationship that was healthy and vibrant and where you saw this you know, these two people who weren't two broken halves coming together to be one, but that were two holy individuals that made each other better, you know, so. How, how important do you think it is then um, to have that sort of manifestation and imagery of what you're looking for in a relationship? To, to intend that in order to manifest it? Is that what you mean? Yeah, very important. Um, and I think that that's what happened for me. Um, I began to see, I think that it's like, once you start to see a relationship, the, the unhealthy relationship that I was in with my ex-husband, once I could start to see that for what it was, and then I started to see what a healthy relationship looked like, um, you know, I, it, it kind of happened it happened on its own. It's like, this is no longer acceptable to me. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to tolerate this. And if you're not, if, if we can't make this relationship healthy, I need to go. Um, and that was a, that was scary. It was a very scary thing. Um, because I had kids, how am I going to support my kids? How am I going to support um, myself financially? I, you know, all those things that come into play um, and letting go of, the hope for this relationship to ever be what I had wanted it to be and hoped for it to be. Um, and then on the other hand going, but I know I can, I, I, I can have something better. I could, I can be in a relationship with somebody who really values me and sees me and supports me and loves me authentically. Um, you know, putting that intention out, um, made me willing to wait for a while, <laughs> you know, yeah. after my divorce, I, I was willing to wait for, and, and then that might've meant waiting indefinitely, but I was like, I'm not going to settle anymore. Um, I deserve better. And some of that was that inner work that I had to do that inner healing work to believe that I deserved something better. And I think that whole idea of waiting and until you're in the right place, until you meet the right person, it's really important. Um, I can speak for myself, growing up in a dysfunctional family, you know, I snapped up the first 
guy who was willing, you know, to propose to me. And well, that didn't work out. Um, but I didn't want to wait. I wanted out. I wanted out of my family situation. Um, I see my kid who are at that age where they're seeing their friend getting married and whatnot, and they start, you know, start playing with their mind that, you know, oh, time's slipping by. I'm going to be alone forever. Uh, I'll never have find that relationship. When in reality, if you're only 30, <laughs> You got plenty of time, <laughs> um, you know, but, but we have this concept of, of what's right, you know, how old we should be, you know, when, we, when we're having babies and, you know, when our careers are, you know, you know, just getting set off and, and, and it's just, you know, we really have to get rid of, I think, that timetable that is sometimes, somehow has been ingrained in all of us of, of how things are supposed to be. I agree. Absolutely. And just allow things to be what they will be, <laughs> you know, instead of trying to control the process and, um, and what's wrong with being alone? <laughs> you know, like, why? Well, you're absolutely right. And I actually have some female friends who um, chose mm -hmm. to, can, you know, be single and they're in their 50s and 60s. And I, I wouldn't have done this any other way you know I've been happy having my life the way I want it so um, it is interesting um, and I love seeing people who are able to step outside of that little you know zone that that we've all gotten ourselves you know uh, caught up in of, of what's right and what's wrong so um, I think it's just a matter of living outside the box and just finding what's right for you I was just about to say living outside of the box and coloring outside of the lines, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, let's talk a little bit more about your, uh, your story. Um, and that um, you were very good friends with, with, with Bob, but he was married at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And you were friends. I mean, very good friend. Um, and so it's a, and I don't want to give too much away because, you know, nobody cheated on anybody. There was nothing, you know, nothing bad or nothing wrong. But um, I, I do encourage people to read the story to see how that dynamic happened, where you went from, you know, friend to then Sandy uh, losing her battle with cancer. And, uh, and then there was that oddness between being friend to saying, Oh, we might be able to have a relationship here. <laughs> so it's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story because I, I, I think you really had to think it through before mm -hmm. making a conscious decision that um, an intimate relationship, you know, was okay when you had been all these other things in terms of friends and whatnot. So I love that part of your story. Um, I remember the first time I thought he was cute in that way. I mean, I always thought he was adorable as a human, um, but all of a sudden I'm like, hmm. <laughs> like, I never saw you that way before. He's kind of cute. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> and then I was like, and then I was like, oh gosh, is it too soon? Is it, you know, should I be yeah. having these feelings? And yeah, so yeah. Um, I, yeah. I don't want to give it away either. I want you guys to read that story, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but there was it, the other thing too is um, reading about when you were diving, um, which is a difficult sport, and and you were good. Um, but I remember you saying, but your father, it was like you weren't good enough, so it suddenly lost kind of its appeal um, it for something that you really wanted to strive for. Um, but what I wanted to say about that is that it, it reminded me of a couple of days ago when I was swimming, because I'm swimming for health and exercise now, and I was feeling very, very frustrated because I'm like, I'm out here like, three or four times a week. I'm not seeing my stomach budge, you know, nothing's happening. And then as I'm swimming those laps, there was at one point I said, I'm swimming for my health and I feel better. I already feel better. I've been feeling better since I've been doing this. So I need to take the focus off 
you know, what's going on on my, you know, my stomach <laughs> and my thighs and my, you know, behind and everything else. But, um, but it, it, it was a kind of a pivotal moment for me to remember that, that I was doing it for health and um, other things will follow. And, uh, and I know in the diving world where that body image is, I mean, you can't have an ounce of fat anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, yeah that had- it's like that with figure skating, you know, dancing, you know, any of the gymnastics, any of those sports where your body is exposed, you're not just being judged on the way you perform a dive or, you know, a routine. Um, you're, you're being judged by how you look. And it was, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, for, you know, teenage girls, which oftentimes we start when a lot of times you start even younger than that. I was, I was a preteen when I started. Um, and, you know, just that pressure to be, to look perfect and also to be perfect because you're getting scored on, you know, for diving, it's on a scale of one to 10. And, you know, if you get a seven, it's like, oh, you know, a seven, um, so there's just this pressure to be perfect. And, you know, for somebody who already was struggling with perfectionism, um, you know, it was, it was very difficult um, for me. And then I had my father um, who, you know, I, I think he wanted me to be the very best that I could be. He wanted me to get scholarships. And I don't think it was coming from a bad place at all, looking back. Um, but unwittingly, you know, he reinforced that by constantly reviewing my videos of my diving meets and pointing out all the flaws and all the mistakes I made. I I was already doing that. I didn't need help with that, you know? So, um, eventually I lost my love for the sport and it was, it was really kind of sad and unfortunate looking back because I, it was such an important part of my life for so long. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I'm sure it did a lot to teach um, discipline and um, and what body health, feeling good um, um, means, um, which carried over into eventually yoga. Um, but we got to wrap it up here. My gosh, time went fast. But I have, I do have a, a last question, and it it it's more about the writing process. Can you share with us? what it was like to put your story down on paper and to, you know, like pull it out of you and put it out there and know that you were going to share all this with people. Yeah, it was terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) It's very exposing, you know, because it's one thing to share your story one-on-one or even in, you know, a group setting, but now anyone and everyone could potentially see my story. Um, And I think that for me, that process was about letting go of the shame that I had about my story. And I thought that I had really done that inner healing work in that way, Uh, but there were still layers of shame that remained as I was writing. I'm like, do I want to say that? Do I want to share that? You know, in doing that, there was so much freedom. Um, I think it took me to levels of healing that I never knew were possible um, because it's about, okay, I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to be authentic and share what my journey has been in hopes that it will inspire somebody, help somebody, encourage somebody, whatever the case may be. But, you know, with that goal in mind, that made it so much easier. But in the process of doing it, I felt just like I was liberated, like this part of me was just opened that I hadn't realized I had kind of locked down because of shame. So thank you for inviting me and constantly encouraging me. And, and, you know, that was really an important part of the process for me. Well, and I appreciate you sharing that because that's, I've seen it so often and that, that's what I do try to, to, to tell people who are very reluctant is that you have no idea, um, you know, what that liberating feeling is going to be 
you know. And if in the end you you choose not to share the story, that's okay. But I feel even the process of putting it down on paper is a very very powerful um, process to to because you know when it's just running around in your head, you're not really you know it doesn't follow a timeline. It doesn't make all. It doesn't. You don't connect the dots when it's in your head. But when you start putting it down on paper, you connect the dots and you understand more. You know why you are who you are, um, and why you come to where you're at. So I'm very proud of you. I appreciate your enthusiasm um, that, that we've um, been sharing all along the way and for being here on the podcast. Um, so look forward. Um, you know, you Lemonade Legend listeners out there for the Lemonade Stand Book 2, From Sour to Sweet, An Alchemy and an Extraordinary Journey of Virtue. Um, February. <laughs> as close as I come. February. <laughs> Thank you everyone for tuning in and I hope um, you all have a, a great day and um, we'll be talking with you um, and next time. All right. Thank you, Don, so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Thank you, Michelle, for all that you do to inspire people and encourage people. And the work that you're doing is, is really making a difference in the world. And it, it certainly made a difference in me. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Lemon tree, very pretty, and the lemon flower is sweet, but the fruit of the poor lemon is impossible to eat. Lemon tree, very pretty, and the lemon flower is sweet, but the fruit of the poor lemon is impossible to eat.